the Disney MGM Studios in Orlando, Florida. Welcome to a conversation with Betty White. enjoyed being here today and thank you so much <laughs> if you think I'm not gonna quit while I'm ahead oh bless your hearts for all that stuff well listen we might as well hang out here and find out what what do you want to know <laughs> that I can tell you I could tell you things about the Golden Girls that would curl your hair <laughs> my darling Golden Girls I won't do anything but tell you how much I love them. Who wants to speak for? Yes. How many questions? Can I ask three questions? So you one can ask time. 27 as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> First question is, every time on the Golden Girls, you girls get together, you're always eating junk food. How do you stay so thin? Well, I, I'm going to stay sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, you don't really notice Rose eating a lot because I can't afford it, but Rue, who is on a perpetual diet, always figures that if she eats on camera, it's not fattening. So she eats it as much and as fast as she can, and then when between times, she wouldn't touch it. Second question. Uh, the tabloids have you and the Golden Girls in a tip. Is there any truth to that? <laughs> Every year. Every year. Every year they go through. We storm off the set, or we don't speak. I love this last one. It was, what was it that they called our set, the freezer, and we only communicate through the director. Well, the exact opposite is true. I don't know. They get these, these stories out of whole cloth, and unfortunately there are people who pick up those garbage newspapers and they believe what they hear. We not only are professionally admiring of each other, we adore each other. The friendship is so solid, and that's hard with four ladies working together in close community. And when you figure, we, we're saying that at the end of the fourth year. This isn't just a new kid on the block. They're a joyful bunch, so the, we just can laugh that other stuff off. But they also, one of the other papers, had two pictures of me. Now, you know how photographers are always taking zillions of pictures. You never see them until magically down the road a piece, they show up in one of those papers. And they had me in a very distinctive black and white top over a chiffon skirt with two different men. One was Rudy Belmer, my great and good friend that I've known for 40 years, who has a very steady lady whom he adores, and my good friend Jerry Martin, who is my commercial agent. Well, they had, I was trying to decide between which one to marry. I just couldn't make up my mind. I'd spend one weekend with one and then one weekend with the other while I was trying to decide. And the line that cracked me up was, you know, a lot of girls have, one man and several dresses. Betty has two men and one dress. <laughs> Third question. You have great legs. I mean, when you, sometimes on the show you do a lot of dance numbers. Oh, come on <laughs> now. What are you... <laughs> I noticed you sang. I mean, you, you have a lovely voice. Have you ever done dancing? I mean, professionally other than... I'm one of those the that they, show. as they say, she moves well. You know, I've never studied dancing, but I love to dance. And every once in a while, you just do a few easy moves, and that's always the fun one. And I, I did a lot of musicals in stock, and uh, so you, you have to dance a little. I love it. Blanche, if you can't do a simple dance, how do you expect me to believe that story about you and the Flying Finelli Brothers? <laughs> I get flushed every time I pass a jungle gym. <laughs> oh, come on, Blanche. That story is 
no truer than the one you told about you and Buzz in the lunar module. <laughs> oh, that does it. Rose, I would never lie about the U.S. space program. <laughs> Awkward when it comes to my body, huh? No coordination? You want to see your body defy the laws of nature, physics, and Dade County? <laughs> Hit that music, girl, and follow my lead. Look into my eyes. There's a mouseketeer if I ever saw one. How did it feel like when you first started to work? To walk? To work. Oh, to work. I thought to walk. <laughs> let's see, Betty, let's get this straight. I did learn to walk before I learned to work. <laughs> I was so excited, I did a commercial. It was a, it was a, you might know it was an airline commercial, and it was for radio. And I, I made, you know, less than it cost me to get into the union to do it. And I borrowed the money from my father. And he said, well, sure, honey, that's fine. If you don't work too often, we can almost afford it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was a thrill, sweetie. And then one thing leads to another to another. And each thing just, it's like a, a you drop a pebble in the water. And, and you never know where it's going to lead you. But it was, it's still exciting. And I hope it always will be. Yes, back there. I just... Love the way you put down people. If I can only learn how to put down my boss that way, make him feel good still. That was great. Remember, I'm playing a part. I wouldn't have the guts to do that in person. Well, what a nice surprise. I happen to be in the neighborhood. Doing what? Coming to see you. <laughs> oh, Mary, I love this apartment. I love what you've done to it. I haven't done anything to it. I know. That's your guts. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad I'm not leaving WJM. You have no idea how I'd miss you. I'd probably cry every time I looked at a melon. <laughs> coffee experts agree a good cup of coffee should always be savored just as it comes from the pot. Mm. Hot, rich, and black. <laughs> I just have a little cream and sugar. <laughs> Hi. Come on Mary. in. <laughs> oh, we're early, aren't we? No, no, not a bit. Oh, yes, we are, dear. Listen, you pretend we're not even here yet, and you go on and finish putting on your makeup. <laughs> I have finished putting on my makeup. <laughs> <laughs> well, suit yourself. <laughs> like the real you, Sue Ann or Rose? Boy, you know, I thought I always, Alan used to be asked that question, Alan Ludden, and he always would say, because Sue Ann was a rotten person, but a wonderful home economist, and he'd always, <laughs> true, and he'd always say, Betty and Sue Ann are the exact same person, except Betty can't cook. Uh, <laughs> and I heard it so often that I believed it. But I see so much of Betty and realize how much of Betty is in Rose. She thinks everything's going to have a happy ending. Rose is so naive that people can say terrible things to her and about her, but the words all sound so nice, and if they say it nicely, she thinks, oh, that's swell. And I, uh, I really think, and I tell long, boring stories, I really think there's a lot of Rose in Betty. I think Rose, Rose is more... You like Rose better? I like Rose. You know, she's not dumb. She's just dim. She just marches a different... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, she takes everything literally, the exact meaning of the word. If you said I could eat a horse, she'd call the SPCA. You know, that she takes everything. It's ridiculous. I mean, here we sit, calmly eating our bran flakes, when there could be a dead man in the house. I'll go. She's very brave. Boy, I'll say. I want someone to come with me. <laughs> I'll go, I'll go. I'm 
from Sicily. What's the big deal? <laughs> He's not dead. But he'll wish he was when those two barge in on him. <laughs> Who is he? His name is Al. No, I mean, what's he do? He imports diamonds. Oh, damn, I hope he's not dead. <laughs> he bought the farm. What farm? Rosie's dead. No. Yes. Oh, my God. The poor man. And with a new farm and everything. <laughs> poor Rose. You mean so bad. show and if so what was your first date i met him it was the third week of the show in 1961 and uh, the show had been on as i say it, it had just opened and and it, it opened as a big success uh i was booked on it i came back from california to do it it was out of new york at that time so i met him very briefly we played the game uh did five shows together and he was so friendly and so nice and i went back to california that summer, uh, our agents booked us each into a, into a play, Critics' Choice, to play on Cape Cod and then on up into Maine. And so Alan made a trip to California. He said, I think as long as we're going to play the show together, it's playing at a small theater near here, we ought to go and, and see it together. I thought he was married. I didn't know he was a single fool that I was. <laughs> so we went out that night we went to see the show and I was happily going with somebody else I mean I, very steadily for four years the first night that we opened my friend came in to see the show and there was a kissing scene at the end of the of the first scene and it went on maybe a little longer than you would think <laughs> and from the third row I heard Phil Cochran <clears throat> And he was the first one who realized there was more there than, than I knew or than Alan knew. And within that three weeks, he started saying, will you marry me instead of hello in the morning? And I laughed him off. It took me a year to get smart and marry that man. I was out of my mind. I would have had another whole extra year. Hello, Betty. Hello, Alan. <laughs> what are your plans for the summer, Betty? Well, I'm going to do some stuff. <laughs> what did you have in mind, Alan? <laughs> Sure. You're recognized when you walk in someplace, someone goes, oh, you're Betty White, you know. Has, what is the most embarrassing moment as being recognized you've, you've had? I mean, you walked into a place you didn't want to be recognized, and someone says, oh, that's Betty White. I try to stay out of those places. <laughs> Over here, right there in the middle. Of all the famous people that you've ever worked with, who did you enjoy working with the most? Of all the famous people, well, I have to say Mary Tyler Moore because she was my best friend before I ever got on the show, and she still is my best friend. And watching Mary work is just a, a pleasure in itself because she, uh, she set such a standard for everybody around her. She and... Uh, when she was married to Grant Tinker, Grant Tinker and my husband, Alan Ludden, were best friends for, well, in fact, it was Grant who brought Alan to New York from Connecticut. And the first people Alan ever took me to meet when he was getting serious about me were Mary and Grant. I always accused him of trying to get their approval first to make sure they approved. But uh, I have to say Mary, because everybody measured up to Mary's standard. She was always so precisely on time and so good at what she did and asking no quarter. She was never the star of the show. She was just one of the guys. <laughs> Why do you want to be on our show? You're the happy homemaker. Yes. And the happy homemaker is very unhappy. About what? I have done that show every day since July 1963. Do you know what that means, Mary? It means... I've been smiling for 11 years. I never thought of it that way. I want a job where I don't have to smile. I don't like smiling all the time. It's against my nature. Suanne, you're smiling. I am. Right now. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm 
in a rut, Mary. Everything I do is mechanical. I... I just go through the motions. Ah, oh, well, Sue Ann, come on. Everyone feels that way about her job sometimes. But I can't pretend anymore. I... I've cooked it all. <laughs> I've eaten it all. I've cleaned it, trimmed it, and stuffed it. <laughs> Yeah. I want to know, what is your secret for being so beautiful? beautiful. You keep yourself beautiful. <laughs> I think it's your eye, doctor. <laughs> Thank you for your vote of confidence. I appreciate that so much. Yes, back there? When the Golden Girls, uh, you wear such terrific outfits. Do you pick them out? Do you have a choice, or do they pick them for you? No, we have a wonderful lady, Judy Evans, who's our wardrobe uh, coordinator, and she makes all of these clothes. She makes a lot of Rue's clothes, and then she goes out and shops for me, and, and mine come off the rack, but I think she does... <laughs> Let's face it, I come off the rack. <laughs> yes. I love the way you play Rose, but if you could pick one of the other characters characters to play, who would you play, and who would you have play Rose? You know, it was funny, when they, uh, when Susan Harris wrote the script and they were putting the show together, uh, Jay Sandridge was the director, and we got a letter saying uh, this uh, project was in the works, and they would send a script as soon as one was written, and they were kind of writing Blanche for me, and Jay Sandridge, who had directed all the Mary Tyler Moore shows, was also going to direct this. And it was Jay in his wisdom who said, if we have Betty playing Blanche, another neighborhood nymphomaniac, in their, you know, in their wisdom, the, the audience is going to equate that with Sue Ann Nevins, and it's like playing the same thing. So why don't we have Rue play Blanche and Betty play Rose? Well, we knew who Blanche was, and we knew who Dorothy was, and we knew who Sophia was, but somehow Rose was sort of an amorphous character that it was difficult to pin down. And again, it was Jay, and I, I thank him every time I see him, who said, she's a complete innocent. Just play her totally innocent, not dumb, but totally innocent, and it'll work. So I try to remember that. Sometimes I get the innocence lapping over into dumb, but she's not really. If that happens, it's my fault, because Rose isn't dumb. She just marches to a different drum. You know, I'm still a little confused. Now, who exactly is Ricky? <laughs> Lucy's husband. I thought Desi was Lucy's husband. Not on the show. Desi wasn't on the show. Desi played Ricky. Who did Lucy play? Lucy. I know, but who did she play? <laughs> Lucy. Right, but who did she play? Lucy played Lucy. <laughs> well, then why didn't Desi play Desi? He wasn't tall enough. <laughs> somebody to do your hair and fix your makeup and to put your clothes out for you? No, I was born just gorgeous like this. <laughs> Sweetheart, I must tell you, it takes six men and a small boy to get me out on this stage. There's a lovely hairdresser, there's a lovely makeup gal who, who put you together like this, and uh, this is my dress, but it was made for me by the lady who works on Golden Girls, so between all of them, they managed to paste me together and get me out here. But that's fun. That's another thing about acting that's fun. You get to dress up all of Yes? You know, you make, you say all these crazy stories oh. about St. Olaf. Yes. Who makes them up for you? The writers make them up, and the... I just think some of them are such fun, and I, to try to read them with a straight face is not easy. <laughs> and then just, I think it's their own little game, they throw these Scandinavian names this long, Verbolkdeskotter and, and those, and Gefürchtenflaven, and they mean nothing, but you have to memorize them, and you have to do them exactly, and it's a, it's a challenge. And we break, a couple of times we've gotten so broken up, we've had to do the thing about four times before I can get to spit the words out. <laughs> Rose, is this another one of those Scandinavian Viking concoctions? Yes! <laughs> it's called Gnurkenflutten cake. <laughs> it's an 
ancient recipe, but I Americanized it. Yeah, so one might say you brought Geflerken Erken into the 80s? <laughs> yes, but I'm not one to blow my own Beethoven flugen. <laughs> I can't even reach mine. I think that's easy. Yes. Is there really such a place as St. Olaf? No, there isn't a town named St. Olaf, but there's a wonderful college in Minnesota. Yes, isn't it great? And it is, it's, I get such marvelous mail from there, and they send me t-shirts and jackets and sweaters until practically I have St. Olaf tattooed on my chest. But it's, they have a marvelous 70 a uh, person choir who came out to Los Angeles to sing at the uh, Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. And they came in mass to see the show one night in our live audience. And it was such fun because Rue and I had learned their, their cheer, which is, um, ya, ya, um, ya, 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 sure, ya, betcha, is the way it ends. <laughs> but they also taught us the, the school song. Which we come from St. Olaf, we sure are the real stuff. The team is the cream of the... Well, it's a wonderful song as well. <laughs> and so it was somebody's birthday that night, and in return for our singing, they sang Happy Birthday, and this gorgeous choir of 70 voices sang Happy Birthday. Rue and I, needless to say, didn't sing anymore after that. But they just... I feel like I went to St. Olaf. They've been so warm and wonderful, you'd think they wouldn't be speaking to me. Is there, um, where did you really grow up? In Los Angeles. Oh. And I went to Beverly Hills High School. I went out to Los Angeles when I was about a year old from Oak Park, Illinois, where I was born. And California was a state then. A lot of people doubt that, but we were. We were a state. <laughs> yes? I would like to know where your sense of humor comes from and who would you accredit to shaping your uh, character? My mother and father. I was the luckiest girl of the world. I was an only child, and they, there wasn't a straight man in the house, and they kind of dealt me in on all their jokes, and if I didn't understand them, they just didn't explain them. <laughs> and as I got a little older, Dad would come home, and he'd tell the jokes, and he'd say, honey, I think that one we don't take to school. You can take that one to school, but don't take that one to school. So it was just, it was just wonderful. We, we laughed a lot, and we, we cried a lot together, and we just had a, it was a great growing up situation. Yes. When you have time off, do you have any hobbies or things that you like to do? Well, I'm a needlepoint freak, for one thing, and I have, I have a house up in Carmel. I'm so lucky to have that, that it's right on the water, and I walk the beach a lot and collect sea glass and, and shells and that kind of thing. So those are kind of my, my hobbies. And then work is my hobby. When I'm, when I'm off work, I'm doing some other kind of work, and I love to write. Yes. How many times have people try to strangle you on, in your movies? Oh, quite a few. Have you noticed that, too? Yeah. yeah. I don't know whether it's a symptom or not, but I know that B, whenever that comes across, or whenever she has to hit me over the head with something, she just enjoys that. But never can quite get it on the first rehearsal. She has to do it again. <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think maybe it's a, a, it's a wishful thinking thing. I think there are so many people who would have wanted to strangle me through the years that maybe they just put it on television. Rose, that is a happy woman in there. Now, I want you to promise that you will not say anything. Do you promise? Do you promise? <laughs> Are you sure? But what's got me so sad? <laughs> oh. Oh. oh I, just, I just never, never had two better friends. I just can't stand the thought of leaving you. <laughs> <laughs> Blanche, you look gorgeous. Oh. Shut up, Rose. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes, I guess. Stop! <laughs> yes. Has comedic timing always come easy to you, or is it something you've had to work on? And who are your favorite comedians? Oh. But comedic, comedic timing is something I think it, you just learned by osmosis. Um, I was an only child, and I had two of the best parents in the world and there wasn't a straight man in the crowd and we would we laughed a lot and we we would we were always you know 
pulling things on each other or, or telling jokes. And in those days, it wasn't the slip on a banana peel kind of joke. It was a, a little more intellectual than that. I think, speaking of favorite comedians, we just lost one recently who was not only my favorite comedian, she was a favorite friend. And uh, I must say, whenever you called on Lucy, as a performer or as a friend, she was right there. When I lost Alan, I remember she decided she was going to personally take care of my not being lonesome, so she kept inviting me over to her house to teach me to play backgammon. And I was the biggest disappointment in the world to her because she just couldn't. And I love all games, but I couldn't learn backgammon from her because she played it so well that she'd say, here, you throw the dice, and then you move this, and then you move this, and that's it. Now, how come you can't get that? I can still hear her, God love her. Uh, yes, sir. How has uh, working with the Golden Girls cast uh, affected you? Are there any characteristics that have rubbed off on you? Oh, I'm sure. I think I've probably learned an awful lot from Blanche Devereaux that I've... <laughs> Isn't she great? Isn't she wonderful? No, the thing about the, the girls... Now, B and I had been friends for years. Uh, Rue and I had worked together on Mama's Family, and Rue and B had worked together for years on Maud. Estelle was a, was a new starter for us, and we adopted her immediately. But the first, as well as the friendship, the professionalism of these gals. Nobody has to wait for anybody to get their hair fixed or learn their lines. Everybody comes in with the lines learned. Everybody comes in ready to go to work on time so that you can relax and have fun and horse around a little bit. It's when somebody isn't professional, bless you, somebody isn't professional about his business or her business that uh, that's when the trouble starts. So then you overlay the friendship on top of that, it's, uh, it's just a joy, it really is. Yes, sir. I know my favorite story of roses has to do with the Herring Circus. And um, I hurt my back the, the night that that aired, and they had to take me to the hospital, honest to God, because I was laughing so hard. <laughs> I saw this constant big run, I have a splitting headache. Oh, girls, let's face facts. The three of us just can't agree on anything. I mean, it is obvious we were not meant to live together. I hate to agree with you, but I think you're right. I think so, too. In fact, I know so. This is exactly what happened during the Great Herring War. <laughs> the Great Herring War? Yes, between the Lindstroms and the Johanson. Oh, that Great Herring War. <laughs> The two families control the most fertile herring waters off the coast of Norway, so naturally it seemed like it would be in their best interest to band together. Oh boy, was that a mistake. You see, they couldn't agree on what to do with the herring. Oh, well, that's understandable. I mean, the possibilities are overwhelming. <laughs> exactly. The Johansons wanted to pickle the herring, and the Lindstroms wanted to train them for the circus. <laughs> Weren't they kind of hard to see riding on the elephants? <laughs> oh, not that kind of circus. It, a herring circus. Sort of like Sea World. Uh -huh. Only smaller. <laughs> much, much smaller. <laughs> but bigger than a flea circus. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, tell me, Rose. Um... <laughs> Did they ever shoot a herring out of a cannon? <laughs> But they shot him into a tree. <laughs> After that, no other herring would do it. Oh. <laughs> yes, way over there. I had the pleasure of meeting you at the airport. Uh, I shook your hand. I was quite impressed with your grip. Can you tell me? <laughs> Your exercise uh, regime or whatever. Do you do you play racket sports or anything like that? Think you're playing with kids? <laughs> My dad and I used to love to play catch 
out in, in the front yard when he'd come home at work. And we'd, we'd play catch. And I had a glove, and I'd throw. And he said, I don't want you to throw like a girl. He said, two things I don't ever want you to do like a woman. The only two things that I don't. I don't want you to throw a ball like a woman, and I don't want you to drive a car like a woman. That was back in the days when they thought women were bad drivers until we proved them wrong. And so I guess from, from that kind of thing, uh, I guess you get a kind of a firm grip. I don't like the dead fish handshake. Do you? When people are nice enough to come up to you and you get something like this that you just want to sort. Of, you know. <laughs> yes, over here. The spontaneity is very impressive, and I wondered how much of the script do you have to read verbatim, and how much of it is you? We see the script for the first time on Monday morning, and we rehearse it and put it on its feet, and then Tuesday we rehearse all day and do a run-through for the writers and producers that evening. Wednesday, the same thing. And each day we get new pages and new lines. And if we want to try anything or throw something in, they make us feel very welcome to do that. Sometimes they throw it out, but... <laughs> <laughs> and then Thursday is camera blocking, and then we do a, a wardrobe dress rehearsal at the end of camera blocking for the producers and writers. And by Friday, we must be syllable for syllable right with the ink because Comedy is such a, such a, a, an ephemeral thing. You throw in an extra syllable and you kill the laugh. So we really, really try to stay right word for word by Friday. Yes. I'd like to know, what do you do with your Emmys? Where are they, where are they sitting in your house or do you have them on display? Well, you know, it, it's kind of an ego trip. So you, you try to be as subtle about it as you possibly can. In the dining room, I have a yellow hutch and they're all lined up. <laughs> One by one, and there are six of them up there because one of them belongs to Alan. He got one for password. So I'm very proud of those golden girls. Believe me, I am. Yes? I was wondering, when did you decide to go from a brunette to a blonde, or was that not your decision? And... <laughs> I was suddenly struck blonde. <laughs> I tell you, I had, I had mousy brown hair that photographed very, very dark. And uh, in Life with Elizabeth, even, they would put that gold spray on it sometimes to pick up the light, or it would just absorb and look like a black helmet, as you can see if you've ever seen those films. Uh, and then a funny little thing began to happen. I, I wasn't as brown as I used to be. There was some other funny color mixed in there. <laughs> So it just looked kind of dusty and rotten, and I thought, well, I just have it tinted a little bit just to kind of blend it. And it kept blending lighter and lighter. <laughs> and now I hear people say, well, Betty White's a blonde. And I think, no, I'm not. Well, yeah, <clears throat> yes, of course I am. <laughs> it was a conscious decision that kind of sneaked up on me. Yes, sir. Um, I'm just wondering, I know you love for animals and everything, and I love cats. I was wondering what your most, what your favorite animal is. I think anything with a leg on each corner. I really do. <laughs> I've been asked that so many times, and one time I'll say lemurs, and another time, of course, cats and dogs, we don't, we don't count them, and horses. But uh, I really, it's so hard. It's like saying, what's your favorite song or what's your favorite book? I just love them all. I mean, the, the long and the short and the tall, I really do. Shocking Pink, yes. Years ago, when you were making one of your shows, our son worked as an electrician. Really? You was worried about him not getting to eat. <laughs> so you went and carried him a bacon and tomato sandwich, and you stayed with him and talked to him while he was finishing his job and eating his sandwich. And he thinks you're the most wonderful person, and we do too. <laughs> oh, what a sweet story! Oh, isn't that nice? I wish I could say I remember that, but all I can say is I bet he was very good looking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. It's like the reunion of the Mary Tyler Moore show. I know Ted's gone, but are the other cast members excited to do that or talking about it at all? We talked a lot about that. They did a This Is Your Life a, a while back. Uh, surprised, oh, surprised me. And we were all together for that, and we talked about it at great length that night. But then when we lost Ted, you can't do it without Ted. There would just be no way. There would be such a big black hole there that uh, I think the chances are nil. That's the camera. When the red light goes on, that means that the camera is about 
I know what I'm doing. Now, just chew me and then stick a sock in it. <laughs> And now with a new feature, news from a woman's point of view, Sue Ann Nivens. Thank you very much, Ted. And good evening. Massive mudslides wreak havoc. Late last evening, huge mudslides in south-central Alaska buried the picturesque little village of Nornsk, long noted for its tapestries and woolly artifacts. <laughs> Cheeked housewives bustling down the cobbled street were swept away by slithering mounds of mud. <laughs> Let's all hope that survivors remembered that stubborn grime can be removed with a blend of <laughs> and cornstarch. And now, back to Ted. <laughs> Listening to you tonight, you must have been had a, a wonderful marriage, Alan. It was just sensational. And uh, I have a sister who just lost her husband, and she's having a rough time with it. And with the marriage you had, I wonder if you could give me any advice I could tell her. You she know, needs help. I get so many letters like that, and those letters I always answer immediately. It's true that that awful first thing you think you're just not going to get through it. I had, depending on whatever is important to you, I had three little dogs who really helped me, you know, because you dissemble, you pretend to all your friends and you pretend to your family and stuff that things are better than they are. But when you're really alone and really feeling rotten, uh, they knew it and I could cry in front of them and I could get it, it out of myself. But there comes a point where you just can't let that happen too often or too long or you, you spiral yourself down into a hole and it's tough to get out of. It's tough to dig out. So. What I used to psych me, I don't know what it, it would work for anybody else. I used to psych myself up and try to concentrate on the moment at hand and stay so busy with that moment at hand that I didn't have time to, to think beyond it or to feel sorry for myself. And then I'd think of the next minute. And pretty soon you find that you've gone two whole minutes without feeling that awful ache. And then maybe five. And uh, it's the only just one little foot in front of the other. And tell her to hang in there, will you? She'll call me and say, you know what day this is? And I'll say, gee, it's Thursday. And she'll say, no, this is the day he left, left the home for the last time. Mustn't this is do the that. day, and, you know. Mustn't do that. Means something to her. Mustn't, mustn't do those anniversaries. You celebrate the good stuff. You don't celebrate those because pretty soon you get underneath. Well, Alan, yes. If there could be a fifth golden girl, who would be your selection? Well, there's a good question. Carol Burnett, I think. Carol Burnett. Can't you just see stirring Carol into that equation and the havoc she could wreak? <laughs> I want to kill you! Please, 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 ladies, look, these spots come right off if you rub it with a dish towel. Now, why don't we all sit down and clean these jars? Well, Naomi, you are one sharp cookie. <laughs> what in the world would I do without you? <laughs> Ellen, Eunice, get over here. <laughs> Eunice. <laughs> oh, Naomi, what a sweet thought. No wonder I love you best. You're like the daughter I never had. <laughs> girls can't see the beauty and share in a warm family moment. Well, I'm the one that brought the dirty jars. You wouldn't have this warm family moment if it wasn't for me. <laughs> now I see why it was so much fun being an only child. I didn't have to go through all that. You know, there's, there's a little bit of... of me and in, in Rose, and there's a little bit of me in, in Sue Ann. I'm afraid there was a lot of me in Ellen. She's a real <clears throat> witch, isn't she? <laughs> yes, over here. Does it, does it help to have things in common with the parts that you play, like Rose on the Golden Girls and you both being widows? Do you draw from real life experience? Yes, it's true, we do. Uh, it wasn't really done intentionally. The writers suddenly had uh, 
me a widow, and they had uh, B. Arthur divorced, uh, that is Dorothy divorced. And they wrote, the first year that we were on, they wrote, uh, we had two mother scripts. And they were rather close together, very meaningful mother scripts. And that first year, both Bees and my mother were ill, and we, we adored our mothers. We were very close with our mothers. And we lost them both within two weeks of each other. And we had to do those mother scripts. And I tell you, it was the toughest thing in the world to play those lines. And B really almost couldn't get through it until, and even now today, if we have to play one of those scenes, we both do one of these things. The hardest thing, perhaps, was the, was the monologue that they had written when Rose tells Charlie, her husband, that she's going to move from St. Olaf, and she does this little monologue in it. It's interesting. It, it's funny. It gets to you. <laughs> I guess that was kind of a silly wish. I know you can't really be here with me, Charlie. It's taken me these past eight months to accept that. But I finally have. Then why our usual little private birthday celebration? It somehow it feels less lonely, Charlie. The other part was I wanted to talk to you. I know I didn't need a special occasion for that. It'd be more of an occasion if I stopped talking. But I, I figured since it was my birthday, you wouldn't be upset when you hear what I've got to tell you. I've decided to sell the house and leave St. Olaf, Charlie. The winters are rough here in Minnesota. And this place is too filled with memories to let me get on with my life. I need to start over without you, Charlie. And I think this is the best way. I know it'll be tough in a strange town, all alone, but I've read some wonderful things about Miami. It won't be long before I meet nice people and, and make some new friends. I have a real good feeling about that. So, I just wanted you to know what I decided. I hope to be in Florida before the next winter comes. But I know that wherever I am, You'll be right there with me. I love you, Charlie. I miss you. It's my birthday. You know the rules. I get the rose. That one really kind of came close to home. Because no matter how I was talking to Charlie, I was really talking to Alan. Yes. This is not a question. It's just a comment. It's a true joy to see you in one-on-one, -on -one, so to speak, today. And thank you for your high energy, your good feelings. And I enjoy watching your show. In addition to that, my daughter does. Oh, that and, is a lovely uh, compliment. Continue your fine work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You do know how to spoil an old uh, 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 girl. And the winner is Betty White, the Golden Girl. I've enjoyed being with you and how dear you you're sending me back to California the happiest lady in the world and I thank you with all my heart <laughs> <laughs>